Just to clarify, what we usually had to do was turn over um, operations to the board clerk, and she would facilitate the meeting until the board president was elected. Um, but Sean was just saying that we spoke to our legal counsel that said actually it should be a uh, already sworn in sitting board member to facilitate the meeting. So, and also to administer the oath to the clerk. And administer the oath. Oh, because the, well, because the. Clark has to have an oath administered. That's, That's true. Right. Hey, That's Chris, right. where are you running the meeting? Huh? Why don't you run the meeting well, for the election? Be, so then as soon <laughs> as we administer, oh, she's back. And you know, no, no, can be no. a person can facilitate until we find. Okay. Until we elect. Okay. So this is going to be a little bit wonky. Got it. <laughs> it is, and we're going to be doing some things differently. We'll also be taking notes. Two, there's a recommended motion to, to right. change policy. But the, the way in which we do open the meeting first, Aaron, can you hear us? Okay. Perfect. Um, but the clerk does open the meeting. So we're probably going to just walk through this ver verbally as we go along, folks. That is correct. Um, is everybody ready? Yeah. Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Motion to nominate. Sean, Dr. Sean Eversley Bradwell, sitting board member to serve as temporary chairperson until the president is elected. Second. You need a vote. Or the motion. Uh -huh. right. So you have to do a roll, or we can just do a raise of hands. Well, I guess we have to do a roll as long as oh, at least okay. one person is yeah. virtual. Erin Correa? Yes. Yes. Eldred Harris? Yep. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Awkwardly, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Jill Tripp? Uh, no, she can't vote. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just Pat. And Pat, Patricia Wasman. Yes. Um, fantastic. And we're going to talk about some of the changes, but to begin with, we're going to do the appointment of the clerk, um, agenda item 1.4. And uh, so uh, I will administer the oath to the clerk. Um, and do we say repeat after me? Is that what we can start with? I, I think so, yeah. Or, or read it. I guess you could just read it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah have her read it, is yeah. what we said. I, Trisha Beresford, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the clerk of the Board of Education of Ithaca City School District according to the best of my ability. Fantastic. Thank you for all your work, Trisha, uh, and the grind. Um, the next uh, agenda item is the administration of the oath of the Office of Superintendent and elected board members. And we'll begin with the oath for the superintendent. Just a question, I mean, not to get too technical, but are we supposed to move and second these resolutions or just do them? Uh, that is a great question. When I went through the agenda, I, I had not thought about it, but we probably should. So we'll move every well, single one. Well, I, do we have to move an oath of office though? This is this is someone's oath. I don't. It's not an action. That we have not. Well, moved. it's the resolution to make him set a superintendent that we need to That's approve, good. and then he takes the oath. Okay, so, uh, but it will not happen for the new school board member, so I don't think there's something we vote on. Okay. But yeah, that wouldn't make any sense. Right. 
Um, we'll, be, we'll, get the administration we'll get clarity on it later on. But yeah. for the time being, you just read it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's just the administration of I doubt to Lou Bell Brown, you solemnly swear yeah. that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of the superintendent of schools according to my best uh the best of my book. Okay. There, there are resolutions for Trisha Beresford and Dr. Luzelle Brown. Do you think we should just back that? Uh, it's a resolution, but there's no motion. Oh, yeah, recommended action. Do we want to back? There is a recommended action here. And a that's not here. Right, for the clerk and for the superintendent, there right. is a resolution or beer resolved. Right. So if we feel like for procedural reasons, we should backtrack and take a vote on both of those. We absolutely can. I don't know that we need to have the person read their oath again. But so, just as a matter of procedure, um, go ahead, Chris. No, I let's do it. So, we will vote on the um, motion for the clerk. So, be it resolved that Trisha Beresford be and hereby is designated the clerk of the Ithaca City School District of Ithaca for the 2022-2023 school year. And it's probably prudent for me to do the roll call at this point in time, right. not the clerk. So, Aaron, we are backtracking. I don't know if you can hear all that. I can. So, voting on the motion for the uh, district clerk. To appoint Trisha Beresford as the clerk of the Ithaca City School District for the 2022-2023 school year. Aaron. Oh, I need a second. Oh, okay. That was moving. I'm moving. Now we're voting. <laughs> second. Yes. Chris Malcolm. Yes. Dr. Patricia Wazalu. Yes. Moira. Yes. Eldred. I'm thinking about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Sean. Yes. All right. Okay, and I will move um, item. Where am I? Uh, item uh, two point one. Item two point one. Resolved that Dr. Lavelle Brown be and hereby is designated the superintendent of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022-2023 school year. Second. And Trisha, you can call the roll. Aaron Froyle. Yes. Dr. Sean Emerson Bradwell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Moira Lane? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Dr. Patricia Wazen? Yes. Thank you all. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. This is only my 12th time through this. So <laughs> you can see that we're operating at a really high level. <laughs> but this is a total different operation than we've ever done before. Yeah. Right. So now we are moving on to agenda item 2.2, which is a motion for the administration of oath of office to elected board members. And uh, I will hand this over to Trisha to administer the oath. Erin, can you hear me? Can. Okay. The elected board of education member, Erin Froyle, has been elected to a three year term to the board of education of Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022 to 2025 school years, and you may read your oath. I, Aaron Croyle, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of the Board of Education member according to the best of my ability. Thank you. Elected uh, board member Jill Tripp has been elected to a three year term to the Board of Education of, the Ithaca, of Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022 to 2025 school year. And Jill, you may be Jill. I, Jill Tripp, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Board of Education member according to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Okay. Elected 
elected Board of Education member, Karen Yearwood, has been elected to a three-year term to the Board of Education of Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022 to 2025 school year. And Karen, you may be Gerald. I, Karen Yearwood, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Board of Education member according to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of you. <laughs> yes. Uh, looking forward to the work ahead, everybody. Um, historically, we have also, this is part of the reason why we have uh, no cards here. Historically, we have elected our board officers, uh, for lack of a better word, by secret ballot. Um, doing some research and talking to our legal team, realizing that a school district or a school board under no circumstances could vote by secret ballot. And so it is a public vote. Following Robert's rules, there'd be a nomination, a second discussion, and then voting. If that nomination does not pass, then we continue to until we can find uh, a board president and a board vice president. Uh -huh. But this will be a public vote for whoever is nominated. So that's where we find ourselves. So you can, these are just gifts uh, <laughs> for a volunteer. Lovely party gifts. <laughs> or lovely welcome right. gifts. So, that's so uh, funny. Yeah. And we made that yeah, only with for pens. <laughs> right. <laughs> and pens. So for agenda item 3.1, uh, we will entertain nominations for president of the board. I nominate Sean Eversley Cranwell. Second. Uh, discussion. Oh. Uh, are you willing to do it? That, <laughs> I think that, that was my spouse said to me not to do it. <laughs> I'm cute. Uh, I would say, uh, I feel so strongly that Sean has exactly the set of skills needed to be board president. He has the experience, he has the temperament, uh, and um, his willingness to uh, to do so much for the school district has uh, been a valued asset uh, for many years now. And I, I will add that um, for those uh, new colleagues who are not aware of this, Sean has chaired the policy committee for the board since at least a year, possibly two years before I was on the board because I used to attend policy committee as a member of PTA council. And um, his expert expertise in policy and in um, checking with the New York State School Boards Association and New York State education law expertise in both parliamentary procedure and his preference for consensus building as a means to conflict resolution is, I think, are all valuable skills um, that I see as really unparalleled among board members. And it is a position that requires a lot of attention to procedure and attention to fairness. And he has a prodigious memory for yes. policy, particularly. <laughs> well, you see how well our wow. procedure has started this morning. <laughs> so, just due to the fact that you did the homework to update all, both of you, you and Moira, to update our procedures and make sure that we are you know, following proper protocols. and having held the position as vice president of the board and knowing what it entails and seeing the amount that you have done over and above what I did in that role uh, is impressive. So I can't say enough for you to hold the role of president. I'll just add that, uh, you know, you look around this table, this group probably has hundreds of years of high level volunteer experience in this community. And beyond. <clears throat> Our budget is the largest budget in this area once you subtract the federal Medicaid and Medicare funds from the county. So this is no small task. Hurting these cats is no small task. For the president's job is to make sure we get out of our own way. Sean does that very well already as well as vice president. And uh, 
I, I expect that he will continue to do it, although hurting me is going to be challenging as usual, but I think the brother's <laughs> up to it. I, I will never say this again, but I hope that's the end of discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Should we call the roll? I'll call the roll. Yes. Aaron Croyle? Yes. Dr. Sean Evansy Bradwell? I'm going to abstain. Eldred Harris? Yes. Moira Lane? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Dr. Patricia Wazel? Right. And, and Jill and Bacon sworn in. <laughs> now, now we're going to get it. <laughs> we're good. Did I call Chris Malcolm? Yes, yes you yes. did. Uh, Jill, Dr. Jill Tripp? Yes. Um, sorry, Karen Yearwood? Yes. Patricia Wozniak? Yes. But just, just for the record, someone now is on the board with a last name who's who comes after, after W. <laughs> <laughs> so after eleven years of being the last person on this board to vote, I see my place as pinch hitter. Well, Yearwood. Actually, it's interesting that in the research that Sean and I were both doing, we came across a number of things. One is about the order of voting. And now we can choose the order of voting. It doesn't have to be alphabetical. And many boards do a rotating uh, one in part with the idea that, you know, that there shouldn't always be the first person to vote be the same person. Yeah. So we might want to think about that. That's something we should definitely entertain as, yeah. as um, But the administration of the oath, I'm gonna go ahead and read if that's okay for folks. I, Sean Eversley Bradwell, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of President of the Board of Education according to the best of my abilities. Fantastic. No. no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, we will. Uh, I'm greatly appreciative of the um, faith uh, moving forward, and I'm looking forward to the work that we have to do. I know I keep saying that, but that's how it changes. Uh, next is the nomination for Vice President of the Board of Education. I nominate Moira Lane for Vice President. Second. Second. <laughs> you guys work that out. <laughs> uh, discussion. Um, I have been so impressed uh, with Moira's ability to navigate difficult conversations but also keep us on task. But and uh, it's it's for selfish reasons because I had the benefit when I came on the board. I had Judy Maxwell, um, former teacher, to help me get acclimated, understand what education looked like, understand what teaching looked like, and Moira was able to fill that role very well. Um, my other road buddy to go visit schools with, and you know, have that relationship with with different buildings and teachers. Um, so that experience, as well as coming on the board and navigating other um, situations, just uh, I, I have more to say, but I don't want to embellish. So. Um, I will I will add comments that that largely echo what Chris has said. Um, ever since Moira came on the board, um, she has been just so reliable, so dedicated, um, has put in a great deal of time. I would, I would say honestly more time than I could put in uh, meeting with, with committees, meeting, working on the uh, retiree insurance issues that come up, uh, doing work on policy. And as as with all longtime school district members who at one point serve on the board, she brings a wealth of understanding of the complexities of this district from the, the, the teacher and employee side and, and the student side as well. And um, I am confident that she will do a wonderful job in discharging the duties of vice president. I'll, I'll just add more. <clears throat> I'm mad at you because you set a bar 
that I may never be able to read, oh. participating <laughs> in a difficult conversation, a long conversation while on vacation in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> At midnight. <laughs> midnight in Portugal. Midnight, midnight in Portugal. So you know, that's right. the name of the song. <laughs> that's that's, a, that's kind of dedication we expect you to. So get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's the end of the session. Should we vote? No, oh, sorry. Unless, unless there's additional discussions. Okay. Aries Croyle? No. Dr. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Jill Tripp? Yes. Karen Yearwood? Yes. Patricia Wasley? Yes. Uh, next item, uh, motion carries. Uh, congratulations, Moira. The vote is. Thank you. Let's go into the work and also, you know, people comment on the time I put in. I am retired. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so I really look forward to working with Sean. You know, he, as well as other members of this board that I've worked with for seven years, have been, you know, role models and mentors to me. Uh, I've learned so much in the last seven years and um, from all of you and uh, you know I I have the time so I when I was encouraging Sean to accept my nomination as president I was assuring him that I will do whatever I can to you know shoulder some of the the you know time uh, um, demands um, that to uh, relieve him who has a very demanding real job <laughs> with pay. <laughs> I don't know if I call it pay. <laughs> <laughs> very kind. Uh, and more, you also have to take your oath as well. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. I. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Um, I, Moira Lang, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Vice President of the Board of Education according to the best of my ability. Fantastic, fantastic. So this is the team that we have uh, in case there's any questions about why Eldred Harris did not take the oath today. Um, within 30 days of the election, um, Elder Harris was required to take the oath for the completion of the term, and that happened a couple board weeks ago. So Elder has already been sworn in for the remainder of the term that he is serving. So just want to make sure folks have that. Um, the next parts of the agenda, some of it is, again, you know, procedural and parliamentary. I will try to explain. We also have uh, our uh, central admin team here who can answer any questions that folks have. Um, for new board members, again, at any point in time, please feel free to ask questions about um, what we're doing. So next up on the agenda is um, item 5.1, appointment of the treasurer. And the motion is resolved that Emily Ship be and hereby is appointed treasurer of the Ithaca City School District for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Oh. Did you move that? I did not. I was just reading okay. it so folks can. I, I move to approve the following district office for appointment as far as, oh, it's several appointments apparently. There are, and I think we should go through each yeah. Okay, I move to approve um, the, the, that um, Emily Scheib be and hereby be appointed treasurer of the Iskell City School District as part of the annual organizational agenda. Second. Second. <laughs> And these are all votes. Um, again, normally we would do them in batches, but I think it's prudent for us to go through each one so we, in case there's any questions. So, discussion? I'm doing a fabulous job. <laughs> and, uh, we'd sit in on a finance meeting, um, and Emily was uh, instrumental when we started updating information sharing. She added descriptors to all our transactions. Um, just 
any money that gets moved around the reason why, um, when we do it, if there's anything, um, also there's changes throughout the year. So if it's adjusted from a previous um, transaction, she makes sure that's updated um, and respectfully so she's also taking it out of um, financial accounting um, jargon to make it so everybody can understand, which I really appreciate. I concur and agree. Additional discussion? I just want to add that I'm, <clears throat> we're volunteers. Last time I checked, we don't get paid. Um, our capacity is doing these jobs well. Really, um, only to the extent that the people who support us make our job easy. And this role is a critical role in understanding the complexities of a $150 million budget. So I really thank our treasurer for boss to the table. I look forward to working with you again in another probably even more challenging financial year. Uh, Trisha, will you call the roll? Erin Correll? Yes. Dr. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Dr. Joel Tripp? Yes. Karen Yearwood? Yes. Dr. Patricia Wasman? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, Emily, you take the oath. Is Emily here? Emily's in her office, but we will administer the oath. Fantastic. <laughs> Appointment of tax collector, item 5.2. So, go ahead. I will move uh, 5.2 appointment of the tax collector. Resolved that Chief Operations Officer Amanda Verber be hereby is appointed tax collector of the Ithaca City School District of New York for the 2022-23 fiscal year. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Um, also doing a panel show. <laughs> and she has held this role for the last. Entire time. Entire time. <laughs> so, this, this is nothing new. This is very procedural. Um, and uh, I can't say enough about what Amanda does, but um, yeah. You just, that's it. Sorry, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I'll add is Amanda, I'm going to get a plaque made for you one day. So you can keep in your office that says, I'm here to get to yes. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah. I'm here to get to yes. That is such an incredibly refreshing thing to hear from your person in control of your finances. <laughs> Fantastic. And at some point in time, I'd like to have a conversation with the board if that makes sense for us to say all in favor and raise our hands and all opposed and all votes named. Yeah, that's good for sense. us to do. If that works for everybody, we'll just ask Trisha to make sure that we're collecting the votes. Does that, does that work? Yeah. Folks? So all in favor? All opposed? Any abstentions? You know, Chris Malcolm is up. Fantastic. Item 5.3. Yes. It's going back when the vice president was not elected. It says that the vice president assumes the chair immediately upon election. That's at this point. I, I saw that, uh, and it's a mistake. <laughs> I think it means we'll fulfill, we'll assume the position immediately from immediately upon election. Like you will, you will fulfill that office. Assumes the office. Yeah, it would make sense if you yeah. voted first <laughs> before the president. But. Right. But, yeah. Uh, yes, I think that is a, an error, and we will yeah. make sure it gets. And if something were to happen to Sean in this room during this meeting, <laughs> Moira would assume the presidency. I step right. out for a second. We're having this conversation. Yes. What is this? Everything, <laughs> everything yeah. Chris. It's, no, it's it, um, Karen had had noted the the uh, language that the vice president will assume chair immediately upon election, and mm -hmm. we believe that that is an error. Yeah. Because it said elected board president will assume chair immediately upon election on page two, three. Yeah. I think we resolved that. Yep. Item 5.3 appointment of claims auditor. I move item 5.3 
that uh, Haley Johnson be and hereby is appointed claims auditor of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Second. Any discussion? We can move voting all in favor. All opposed. That's fantastic. Moving to agenda item six, uh, six point one, the appointment of purchasing agent. Uh, well, six point one, appointment of purchasing agent, uh, resolved that Amanda Berger, Chief Operations Officer, and Sydney Wade, Assistant School Business Executive, be and hereby appointed purchasing agent of the school district of Ithaca, New York, for the fiscal year 2022-2023, and may be authorized to purchase supplies and equipment for services as provided in the budget. Um, and as we spoke to earlier, these are um, procedural and both have facilitated this in years past. I second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? That is everybody. Passes uh, 6.2 appointment of deputy treasurer. I'll move item 6.2 that Sydney Wade be and hereby is appointed deputy treasurer of the city school district of New York for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Second. Questions or discussion? All in favor? That is everybody. Motion passes. 6.3, appointment of deputy claims audit. Um, I will move that Amy Augustine be and hereby be appointed deputy claims auditor of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Second. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, appointment of the records access officer. I will move 6.5. Uh, Dan Bryman, administration officer, be hereby is appointed the records access officer of the Ithaca City School District of New York for the 2022 23 fiscal year. Second. Questions or discussion? I'm confused. We're on 6.4 or 6.5? Five? We are 6.5. Six, no, we're on 6.4. Six, six, four. Six, oh, four. I, I apologize. Yeah. Yes. But you did four. say records access office. I did. And so you named Dan Bryman. Right. I apologize. That's all right. And so that I'm sure my eyes involves are... oil. No. Correct? Y yes, we're, we're, we're on yeah. the right. 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 So the records access officer is the person who is primarily responsible for responding to FOIL requests that the district receives. Yes, I apologize. No, you didn't work. Oh, I that was right. Yeah. yeah. That's all right. Any gotcha. Questions or discussion? All in favor? The only comment is that Dan is the right member. <laughs> <laughs> all opposed. That's, that's a compliment. That's a, yeah, yes. I, I don't answer you very <laughs> Item 6.5. Appointment of Records Management Officer. I'll move item 6.5 that Paul Alexander, the Director of Facilities and Operations, be and hereby is appointed the Records Management Officer of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Second. Questions or discussion? Just have one question. Four, five, six, six, and... Yep, I guess it's five and six. Is that the correct title? Uh -huh. Record. Director, Director of Facilities, facilities and, and Operations. That's still the current. Correct. Right. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is. Oh. Okay. And what is? Then can I ask what is Heather's title? What is Coordinator of Facilities. Coordinator. Coordinator. Coordinator of Facilities. Thanks. Nice. Got it. Good question. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Once a month. <laughs> once a year. Every meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? I mean, we only ask that question once a year. I don't mean that. Elder said, I ask a good question once a month. 
Additional questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion carries in hand. Item 6.6, .6, appointment of asbestos designee A-H-E-R-A. -E I would like to do this one. Okay. Uh, I move that Paul Alexander, the director of facilities and operations be and hereby it is appointed as asbestos designee A-H-E-R-A -E of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York for the 2022-2023 school year. Second. And I asked for this one because I still remember my surprise and delight 11 years ago when I found out that we actually have to officially appoint an asbestos, asbestos designee each year. <laughs> and I take special joy in this one. <laughs> and I second because I have to mentally keep track of every bit of asbestos in the school district because of the prior court history. Additional questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Item 6.7, appointment of data privacy officer. I'll move 6.7, that's Zach Lynn, Chief Information Officer B, and hereby is appointed data privacy officer of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022-2023 school year. Second. Discussion or questions? All in favor? Aaron, we just called the question. Fantastic. Motion carries unanimously. Item 6.8, Appointment of Dignity for All Students Act Coordinators. Uh, I move that Amanda Verba, Chief Operations Officer, be appointed District DASA Coordinator of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022-2023 school year. I also move that the following district personnel be appointed DASA coordinators for each building location of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022-2023 school year. That would be Bell Sherman Elementary School, Principal Jeff Tomasic, Beverly J. Martin School, Principal Jacqueline Richardson, Boynton Middle School, Principal Lauren Wright, Caroline Elementary School, Principal Karen Arnold. Cayuga Heights Elementary School, Principal Lisa Saharis Boudy, DeWitt Middle School, Principal Carlin Gray, Enfield Elementary School, Principal Keith Harrington, Fall Creek Elementary School, Principal Caitlin Bram, Ithaca High School, Principal Jason Trumbull, Lehman Alternative Community School, Principal Deb Pack, Northeast Elementary School, Principal Samantha Little, South Hill Elementary School, Principal Perry Gorgon. Second. Questions and or discussion? Yes. Um, who would care to explain to our newly appointed colleagues what DASA is and its importance? I will humbly ask, um, given Amanda's expertise in this area, to provide a brief summary. Absolutely. DASA stands for Dignity for All Students Act. Um, it was put into law in 2012. It is actually a six hour mandatory course to get any kind of certification through New York State, um, in uh, whether it be a teaching assistant or aide or a coach or principal. Um, and we offer two hour uh, refreshers every single year that's actually mandated by law. Those that are coordinators actually receive more training. The law requires that we have policy around Dignity Act, which is um, the ability to have schools that feel welcome. Uh, for all students to be able to learn undisrupted due to harassment and or bullying and or hazing um, and or cyberbullying and or discrimination. Um, and so through that law, there are a lot of expectations of us as a school district to be able to um, have a connection with families and education for families, students, staff, board members, um, and also to just create caring school climates for young people. Uh, we hold young people accountable, we re report to New York State, we build skills and abilities, we build relationships. Thank you very much, Amanda. And uh, for our new board members as well, at some point in time I'll send an email um, that explains our policy book so you can see where some of these policies are. The good thing about using the 
uh, system that we use for docs is that it's searchable, um, so you can search any policy, uh, any meeting, any minutes, agendas, etc. Um, but you can find more information there, and we'll point out the policy book, especially as it, it needs to change. And I'll just add, previous to uh, this statewide law, of course, the district was interested in the same things, right? And everybody worked hard to ensure kids were safe and felt like they belong. But now there's a uh, now we have now we are accountable to the state, right? So now everyone's clear where the buck stops, and I think for parents and community members, that's an important thing. Any additional questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Whatever that word is. <laughs> Item 6.9, appointment of the treasurer of activity funds and faculty counselor. I'll move 6.9, that the following individuals be appointed to the position as indicated of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Ithaca High School, treasurer of activity, fund, activity funds, Alice Linton, faculty counselor, J Jason Trumbull. William and Al Alternative Community School, Treasurer of Activity Funds, Christy Neely Lehman, Faculty Council Counselor, Deborah Patak, Wenton Middle School, Treasurer of Activity Funds, Deborah Tooty, Faculty Counselor, Lauren Wright, Wit Middle School, Treasurer of Activity Funds, Tracy Compton, Faculty Counselor, Carlin Gray. Second. Questions and or discussion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Agenda item 6.10, appointment of the Workers' Compensation Cooperative Board. I'll move that um, Amanda Berber, Chief Operations Officer, be and hereby appointed to represent the Ithaca City School District on the Workers' Compensation Cooperative Board for the 2022-23 year, and further that Sydney Wade Assistant School Business Executive shall be designated as the alternate representative. Second. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Agenda item 6.11, appointment of community members to the audit committee. I'll move 6.11, that Don Waddell and Ann Reichland, upon the recommendation of the Board of Education Audit Committee, be here, be and hereby are appointed as the audit committee members effective July 1, 2022, through the July 2023 annual organizational meeting. Second. Amanda, can I humbly ask you to explain to folks as well what the audit committee is and its responsibilities? Absolutely. The audit committee actually is a um, mandatory committee um, for free state ed, um, and it uh, serves and meets four times a year, and it goes through uh, the daily operations of the school district at all of the meetings in terms of our purchasing behaviors. They check to make sure that we have purchase orders created prior to spending, right, that we are following for policy. For all of those. That's the internal auditor networking. We then have another auditor that looks at our operations, our daily operations, and they analyze things such as maybe the way uh, athletics is spent or timesheets or vacation payouts, right? So they do um, all different types of work on auditing those procedures and, and our, uh, our um, behaviors around you know, spending money on a daily operation basis as well. And those are topical and we choose those each year. And then finally, we have the fiscal audit. And the fiscal audit um, occurs uh, with Insero, which is a, a auditing firm that we have been utilizing for many, many years. We do an RFP every couple of years. Um, and they look at, right now, we actually have given them, um, we started a couple months ago, all of the financials for the district, right? And so they look at every single um, element of the way that we've spent money through the course of the fiscal year, which today is the very first year of the new one. Um, and then we will get an audit report uh, that we will present at audit committee. And then that report upon exception, um, accepting it by the Board of Education goes to the State Education Department, the Division of Budget and Finance, and that helps with transparency. We also post those audit reports on our website. 
and it's um, for the district operations and also all the extra class funds, right? Those treasurers that she just actually, um, uh, you know, uh, said that could could manage the money for those clubs. We actually have a separate audit report for all the clubs at the secondary schools as well. The district fiscal year is from July 1 to June 30th. So we are beginning today, right? So good luck, Amanda. Thanks. <laughs> this is a really fun time yes. for crossovers. That's so right. Yeah. Great. And not only is the audit committee the only committee that a school board is required to have, any other committee we choose to have, but this one is mandated by the state. We are also mandated by the state to have community representatives serve on that committee. And that's what we're doing here. I'll just say, um, <clears throat> so we, this district has a pretty high credit rating. Credit rating that allows us to go up to the financial market and do things like be working on our second $100 million bond. Keep our buildings intact. Can't spend that out of your budget. Right. One of the reasons we have this capacity and such a high rating is because of the work of Amanda and her crew which the auditors verify. We're not perfect. They always find some. They always try to improve our processes in one way or another. There's nobody here that, um, that doesn't accept that as a way to move forward. But it's those tight knit workings that mean that we have our act together financially. And that undergirds everything we try to do. Any additional questions? Yes. So, which fiscal year are they audited? 2021? So it's 2022, right? So the fiscal year that just ended yesterday is considered to be the fiscal 22. So you always use the last year of that, because they always cross over, right? So it was 21, 22. Um, and so there are still things that like carry over, right? So things that maybe haven't been delivered to us, but we know that we ordered last year. So it takes a little bit of time for all of those books to close. We also maybe have some lingering payouts that have to happen um, for timesheets that were submitted that occurred last fiscal year. And so you'll see all through the summer, you're gonna see auditors uh, in the building. They also work on the TST BOSIS because we have um, a, a business office up there that actually does our payroll, right? Um, and so they'll be working on that and then the reports will start to come out usually in September. And then October 15th is the deadline that the audit has to be done for the fiscal year we just closed, fiscal year 22. Hey, here's a question I have. <clears throat> when they come in now, they won't be able to count the credits that we're supposed to get for transportation and all the state aid. Does that come that's in them later in the year? So uh, everything that came in last year is credited, right? So um, some of the aids work the year after, some of the aids work within that fiscal year, right? So we track, there are things that we know are, um, you know, that are due to's, right? Due to right, the right. district. But when you see the audit report and you go through all those charts, it's very, there's all these footnotes throughout that describe all the different ways that aid flows to districts. And it um, describes sort of like the ones that are in that, that current year and then the ones that we're anticipating um, for the next year. That's right, that's right. So they all, the, the audit report is really about the, the revenue flow in and then the expenditure flow out, right? And it's tracking all that for all of the fiscal operations much more than the $150 million budget, the general fund, yeah. right? It's all of our grants, all of the um, federal monies that are flowing through, the ARP, the ESSER, the title monies, everything is audited, um, All every dollar that we have. And the state um, refunds us, if you will, for a lot of things, for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. We try to make sure we maximize that by doing as much of that stuff as possible. So we can get sometimes 50 cents on the dollar doing a certain thing so it manages to expand our budget helps keep certain things healthy like working buses on the road <laughs> which are very expensive etc cetera, etc cetera. i do so i had a question please do we know that don and uh ann are interested in continuing <laughs> <this position? laughs> that is a great question uh don has been doing this for some time yes and has great expertise Yes. And been doing this, and so he's been great addition. And uh, this is her second to be her second, second year. year. Yeah, yeah. That is correct. So, but yes, I uh, we have checked with them to make sure that they would be willing to serve. No, I think this would be her third year. Her third year. You're right. This would. Be, yeah. So yes, that's that is a no, great question. Yeah. Before we get on, <laughs> it's a fair question. <laughs> so, uh, if no other discussion or conversation.
Uh, all in favor? Yeah, okay, great. So for the board members who are present, it is uh, passed unanimous. Um, bonding of personnel, agenda item, now we're on to agenda items um, seven, 7.1 pertaining to undertakings. Okay, I love this, this title because it's, I don't know what it means, but I'll move that. The Board of we'll, Education. We'll find new language in the future. Oh, this is, okay, this is the bonding one, right? So, okay. Uh, approves the bonding of all persons and positions required by law or regulation to be bonded through a blanket undertaking from a duly authorized corporate surety covering such positions as officers, clerks, or employees. I second. Questions or discussion? So this is basically saying that the, our people that hold those positions will be covered and bonded underneath a uh, reputable company. In case there's any loss. In case there's any loss. In case there's any loss. Right? So it's essentially think about it as insurance. insurance. And certain positions are higher risk than others. And that's why school districts have this. Right? Thank you, Amanda. Additional questions, discussion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Uh, we are now on to agenda item eight. Uh, these are designations. This is designation of regular meetings and discussion sessions of the Board of Education. I'll move 8.1, designation of regular meetings and discussion sessions of the Board of Education that the Board of Education will meet twice monthly on Tuesday, a discussion voting session for in-depth public discussion and a voting meeting. That a combined discussion voting meeting will be held when necessary with prior notice. That the Board of Education meetings will be held at 6 p.m. in the boardroom of the District Administration Building, 400 Lake Street, unless a public announcement is made noting a change or a virtual meeting is required. Second. Okay. Yeah. Questions and or discussion. Yes. Are we given a time frame for prior notice? Is it within a week's time, 72 hours or 24 hours? Uh, we are hours. we are required to, to post notice within 24 hours. Um, for all board members, interesting enough from some research that Moira is doing, is the school district is not the board of education is not required to have an agenda. Though obviously it's considered to be good practice, right. but notice of the meeting has to be within 24 hours. And that's the, the same for a uh, special meeting. And I also discovered that any board member can call a special meeting and give 24 hour notice. So if you're Should. raring to have another meeting. <laughs> Should we add, because um, I know there's confusion out there, it says we'll be held at 6 p.m. And the possibility of going into exact session. Um, there's still ongoing confusion. Folks will show up at six o'clock. Um, then we'll the true, usually the true meats and potatoes of the meeting is seven ish. So I don't know how we best convey that to the public. I think at some point, you know, we we wanted to make that clear, and there was some legal uh, just barrier to to basically saying actually we probably won't start till seven ish because well, the reason. official meeting begins at six when the board president calls the meeting to work. So that's the reality. The reality yeah. is the meeting starts at six. We can and we do say in our agenda we may anticipate an executive session, um, but legally speaking, this is this is what we're doing. We start the meeting starts at six when we go into executive session. So this basically calls to the exact start time of the meeting. Yes. Right. Gotcha. Is there any reason why we wouldn't go ahead and have public comment at six and then go into executive session uh, if it were necessary? It's part of the agenda. Area. Right, it is part of the agenda. Um, and the, there's a policy that talks about the order of the meeting. I wish I could tell you off the immediately and I can find it and let you know. Um, we've been having conversations for the past little bit about what would make the most sense in terms of our uh, meeting schedule. So what I would say is that it's a conversation for the policy committee to 
to talk about because that would have to be voted on. It'd have to go through the policy committee to be approved if we were going to change the order of our meetings. But the, the answer to your question is, yeah, we should, we should look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there are, when the public, often the public means little people, right? Because folks come with kids to celebrate or protest. We've had conversations about how cool it would be to get them out of here earlier, <laughs> right? So they don't have to wait around for us. Uh, but there are obviously things we need to discuss in the executive session. Um, and we often know have student presentations before public comment. Um, and should that actually be a modification of the agenda that's actually, you know, yeah, and, more formally declared? And we can say at any point in time, there can be a modification to the agenda before any meeting, as long as there's a majority of, of approval. Um, what is interesting when you take a look across the state is that various school districts do various things. Some school districts don't have a public comment period. Some put public comment at the end of the meeting, um, and some do it at the very beginning as well, right? So there's not a set standard. Uh, NISBA, the New York State School Board Association, does not have a recommendation about when it should be. Um, or last I looked, they may between the past six months. Um, so we can take a look at that. But that's something that I would say should be an immediate discussion for uh, the policy committee. We can add that. Whoever is on the policy committee can, yeah, <laughs> can and, take that up. And we do not have exec session, executive session every week. There are only certain issues which by law may be covered in executive session because most of the business of the board must be this, um, conducted in open meetings. So, I've noticed in recent months we have had fewer executive sessions and have have not always taken as long as they have in previous years. It's it's impossible to predict um, from week to week. So let me add two things. One, the policy that I was talking about, um, Jill, thank you, Tricia, is policy 2350. That's the policy that outlines what our board meetings are like. There are two circumstances where the board does not need to notify the public in advance anytime there is a meeting with legal counsel uh that does not need to be um something that they're not does not need to be public notice if we are having a meeting with our our legal team and we do not need to notify uh the public when we are having a board development session though we always have um, but there's no public that is allowed in the board development session well, actually, I was seeing some things about development session that uh, um, can't exactly recall, but it, it seemed, what I read seemed to indicate that under some circumstances, the public would be um, part of a development sure. session sure. or, or and we can share to things observe that, it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so we might want to look at that too. We're going to be looking at everything. I <laughs> Additional questions, discussion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Designation for of method for calling regular meetings and special voting meetings. I'll move 8.2 uh, that the method for calling regular meetings and special voting meetings be in, in accordance with ICSD policy 2300 calling regular and special meetings. I second. And this is policy 2300, again, which we would probably look at in collaboration with policy 2350. Um, and it does identify that there has to be at least 24 hours advance notice. So it does specify in our current policy. Additional questions, discussions? All in favor? Breaks, carries. Uh, designation as operative all existing bylaws and regulations. Uh, I move that all existing bylaws and regulations of the city school district is to New York operative at the close of the school year 2022. Should that be 2021-2022? Uh, at this close of the school year, B and hereby are approved for the ensuing year. Yeah, the year, the year. So it should be 2021, 2022. 
Oh, yeah. Last right. year. Last year. Good. So it's right. basically saying it'll carry over. Right. Are approved for the ensuing year or until action by the Board of Education changes or deletes such bylaws and regulations? I'll move it noted with um, as amended. amended. As amended. As amended. <laughs> Presuming that everyone finds it to be a friendly revision. It's a, it's a friendly revision. It's really friendly. <laughs> well, that's, what, that's what time travel is. That's pretty <laughs> Discussion, questions? All in favor? Motion carries. Uh, designation of the Board of Education Standing Committees. I'll move that the Board of Education shall continue the use of standing committees for the fiscal year 2022 through 2023 as follows. Audit committee. Curriculum Innovations and Strategic Partnerships Committee, Facilities Committee, Finance Committee, Human Resources Committee, Legislative Advocacy, Advocacy Committee, and Policy Committee. Second. Uh, thank you. Let's do the math. That's, that's nine of us divided by seven committees. <laughs> it usually means that most board members serve at least on two committees. Some serve on three, depending on interest and time. Uh, these are the committees we have done numerous things throughout the years. So, for example, at one year or maybe two years, we combined finance and facilities. We found that that was not a productive use of time, given the significant amount of work that each of those committees uh, needed to do. So they were separated. Uh, probably, um, Elder, you would know better than me, I want to say five years ago, we created the Legislative Advocacy Committee. Um, we were doing some of this work anyway. I would say uh, it's like seven years ago. There, there you go. So yeah. someone could do the math better than me. Uh, APPR started. And, and folks traveling, uh, meeting with our local elected state officials and federal officials, traveling to Albany on a pretty regular basis. Um, and doing some pretty strong advocacy work in the legislative area. Uh, and then the other communities I think are somewhat self-explanatory. We did rename, it used to be the Curriculum Committee, and it was renamed the Curriculum Innovations and Strategic Partnership Committee. Um, and that, I don't know how long ago that was, so I won't. <laughs> Maybe three two three years ago. Three years ago. Three years say three, four, three? What did you say about that? Three years ago. There it is. And so traditionally, there are three board members on each committee, and we do try to pay attention if there's going to be an issue where there would be more board members that it would activate a quorum, then there would require a, a different approach. But any board member is welcome to attend any and all and all committee meetings. So actually, I, and I could probably use a refresher on this too. We try to, but we often fail. I designate them not as committee meetings, but, but as work sessions. And that, I believe, has to do with quorums and decision making and no action, no action, no, no board action is ever taken during committee. We only take action during a full board meeting. So the role of the committees is to make recommendations to the full board for discussion and adoption or rejection. And they're all open to the public. Yes. <clears throat> so when folks, and you probably experienced this running for this term, folks were um, raising concerns that we passed a budget in the middle of the night. No, $150 million budget. We'll be starting the conversation about that budget last week, week. tomorrow. <laughs> right? We haven't already started. So yeah. these are ongoing. Um, process is we have had some people who come to these working group meetings and who have been coming for three or four years for their consistent position. <laughs> so we definitely uh, invite the public to participate. And I would say that the only committee that ever enters executive session is the Human Resources Committee, and it makes sense because sometimes the Human Resources Committee is talking about the employment history of particular individuals. Additional questions, discussion. And when do um, board members get involved in each committee or, or designate a committee? Um, 
since I'm now realizing that Moira and I are the board officers, we will, <laughs> we will be sending out um, an email um, asking you to respond to Tricia about what committees you are most interested in. We will then meet with the executive team um, and try to make sure that we um, comply as much as possible with people's wants, wishes, and talents. And so, we'll also be asking about your interest in various liaison roles. Uh, yep, that will be happening as well. And that is not on here, but right. we try to um, have each school have a board of member um, to be the liaison. And so, then there are several organizations that board members liaise with. ELRC, yeah, PTA Council, PTA Council, TST, BOCE, School Board Advisory Group, that's a group that meets once a month with representatives from the school boards of all the component TST uh, districts. Um, and it used to be, you know, a lunch meeting up at BOCES, nice sandwiches on it. <laughs> uh, but since the pandemic, I don't believe there's been any in person meetings, but it's still been virtual. No, we, we met in person. Oh, you met. Yeah. Oh, you did. Okay. So I think this is also a school year. We'll, we'll be revisiting <laughs> things for a number of reasons. One, because it seems like we are coming back to meeting in person um, through a number of organizations that obviously was disrupted during the pandemic. And so it also gives us an opportunity to revisit what organizations we will have liaisons to, where we are missing out, where we need to be, um, and we'll talk about that with the next uh, agenda item as well. But for the time being, these are the seven committees that are being proposed. Um, if there's any more discussion about the seven committees in particular. Another question. Um, so the committees follow open meeting laws like a board meeting. Yes. So it, there has to be a quorum of board members. No, there does not have to be a quorum of board members. In fact, we try to um, make sure when possible that there isn't a quorum. Okay. A quorum of committee members. Of a committee members. Committee members. So two committee of three members. committee members mm -hmm. need to be there. Yeah. Yes, if there's only one board member at a committee meeting, it does not get held. If there is, it needs at least two board members for a committee meeting. And the, um, with that being said, also the uh, minutes and uh, are not the same requirement as a full board meeting, right? Like we, full board meetings, especially in a hybrid model, require us to have a transcript and minutes. That is not the case for our committee meetings. So I actually have a question along those lines, and we may not have an answer by now. Um, we have gone back to hybrid meetings for board meetings, but all committee meetings for the past year have have been virtual. Are, I mean, that's not actually, it's not a policy to vote on, but it might be a conversation. It is absolutely a conversation for us. But I thought under the, the new guidelines for hybrid meetings, that committee meetings can't be all virtual. That we would have to have a full, we would have to have a quorum of committee members in person. At a physical location. At a physical location. That is correct. Okay, so we will be going back to in-person work sessions. Right. With, a, with a hybrid option. With a hybrid, with a hybrid option. Under the same parameters, I as would a, think, yes. as a regular board. That's what I, the way I understood it. So, Jill, is this making any sense? It is. Okay. Yeah. Because we've been struggling with what does a hybrid option mean? And there's some pretty specific legal requirements that you need to have a quorum of the board at a physical location, even while there may be board members who can participate virtually under extraordinary circumstances. And that is a loose term, but that's the legal language that's used. All right, if there's no discussion about the committees, I'm gonna call the question, all in favor? Honestly, these are our committees for the upcoming year. Um, we also, a couple years ago, well, I'll wait. 8.5 designation of standing advisory committees. Uh, I'll read that one. Um, resolve that the Board of Education shall continue to use the use of standing advisory council for the fiscal year 2022 through 2023 as follows. Capital Project Advisory Committee and Early Childhood Advisory Council. 
Um, second. Discussion and or questions. Okay, so first of all, has the Early Childhood Advisory Council been meeting? And I, um, we met once. I'm going to say once or twice in the last year. So it's not as robust as when Anne cycled off. Right. But we've had conversations with Dr. Brown about you know, whether or not it's still viable, given his work on this issue. But that answers that question. <laughs> I can explain what it is if somebody wants to know. And then a second um, question is. Don't we also have some other advisory committees? Code of conduct. Do we have a there's do we a, have another one? There is a committee on special education. There um, is a request for us to have a oh right. Uh, for us to consider an additional standing advisory committee to right. address um, inclusion, uh, accommodations. I think you, Mary, you've been a part of these conversations. Today. Yes, absolutely. Aaron and I have talked about it being a committee versus a work group and what are the, the benefits, the pros and cons of both of those. Um, we are hoping to update our inclusion plan. We've, we've accomplished the things set forth in the last inclusion plan and would like to strive for greater inclusive practices. And the board can adopt a standing advisory committee or council at any point in time. So even if we don't approve it today, it's not, we can always come back to it at a future board meeting as well. So a point of clarification, because we have just, um, we've approved all the working groups and we have discussed the liaison positions. Yep. And I have not served on either of these advisory committees or councils. These are board directed or district directed? Are they chaired by members of the board? Uh, it needs at least one board member and oftentimes is co-chaired by a board member and a community member, a board member and a district employee. Um, but there needs at least one board member to participate and that's that's not all that's required, um, but oftentimes there are multiple board members, right? So uh, I did not do it as good of a job last year, but Rob and I were both on the Capital Project Advisory Committee and other board members would attend, depending on what the conversation was for that meeting. And we still have a code of conduct advisory no. committee. No, okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> not, that was a little too quick. I, 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 so just to give folks an update for the past three years, we have had a code of conduct advisory council. We believe that we are close enough to a working draft to keep us moving forward with the code of conduct that we will be, um, I think uh, the word that Lily uses, and I think it's phenomenal that we're at year zero, but we will be hopefully putting out a public hearing for the code of conduct once a couple of additional edits are made and uh, reminding our community that this is a working and ever growing and changing document. So at this point in time, we do not need the code of conduct advisory council. It has done its work and it will be submitting to the board at some point in time. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank Dan and thank Lily. <laughs> and uh, honestly, thank Dr. Ann Burns Thomas as well, who has done amazing work on, on this project as well. So that's why it's not listed here. Um, okay. What I will do to the board, and we can also hold off on these committees until the next meeting, uh, because these councils should also include um, a paragraph about what their charge is, um, and the paragraphs are not listed here. Okay. So. I'll just say real quick for the early childhood advisory committee, the whole purpose is to examine the network of services and opportunities we provide for parents and caregivers regarding young and if you have any kids in this community, you know there are significant holes. Right? Despite our investment in uh, pre-K here, despite Head Start, despite all the other activities, parents are still left with a pretty gaping schedule 
uh, in some days they told us it's not worth them even dressing the kids because they got to pick them up at 11 or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. the whole idea was to see if we could expand opportunities for kids prior to kindergarten and um, see how we can partner with the care providers. Welcome to Mac OS. VoiceOver is on. All right. So the, the purpose of the standing VoiceOver off. for the advisory council um, is that it's presumed to be somewhat temporary and that it doesn't require um, as many board members as That's correct. as a standing committee. Yeah, and it provides us an opportunity to include um, multiple other folks who have expertise in the area to help us negotiate this. So the capital improvement or the capital project advisory committee would be a good example, right? That we're working with community folks who also have expertise in the area of mm -hmm. finance and capital projects to help us keep an eye as the project continues to, to move forward. And the use of subcommittees within the committees is established or not established here? Subcommittees so within which committee? Well, for example, um, it seems like under curriculum innovations and strategic partnerships that, that there would be a subcommittee for early childhood. Um, at least, you know, in, in that the ways it, that it differs from school-aged curriculum. Or, but, I don't know if that's not an established. So no, none of our committees have subcommittees. Okay. Uh, not a single one has subcommittee. What we've done, part of the reason why we created this process. So, for example, the policy committee spent a year and a half trying to rewrite the code of conduct, mm -hmm. realizing that that wasn't always the best use of our time and we weren't able to get through it. So we created a code of conduct advisory committee to take that role on. So, and I guess one of the ways to look at it is that, yes, these are subcommittees right the capital project is a subcommittee of the facilities committee right the early childhood could be considered a subcommittee of the curriculum innovations but but, but they they're are time still. limited and and product limited yep. presumably right. okay and okay. they're supposed to again they're supposed to each include a paragraph what that we all that's the, what we're voting on do we agree that this committee should take on this task okay and this time frame? but I, I can say to your point that if we get the uh, special education committee or special education advisory council off the ground, I could see that morphing into the curriculum mm -hmm. one day. It's, it's a natural connection, but the early childhood advisory council right now involves so many outside entities right. that it would be difficult to get it in under our current curriculum committee obligations. One thing that I discovered uh, when I came on the board and I was on the curriculum committee. Curriculum is so gigantic. <laughs> and um, so over the years, I chaired it for a while. Eldred has chaired it admirably the last few years, is struggling to find focus and what's doable um, for and, and appropriate for board members to be working on. Um, it continues to be a a challenge to figure out how to approach this huge thing called curriculum. That is really the guts of yeah. Yeah, school. Right. <laughs> but it's also like, you know, the, the for instance, when I was on curriculum, like, you know, I know a lot about uh, secondary language arts, but, uh, you know, how appropriate is, is it for me to be taking a, a, a really active role in decisions about math. <laughs> so me, I, I, me, Mary, and Lily got this. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. these. So, I, so I would say, summing up your comment, that in the past several years, um, the, the board, the role of the curriculum committee has often been um, to assess the progress of curricular innovations. So we spent a lot of time pre-pandemic uh, looking at um, looking at the detracking of math at the middle school and that curricular shift. And this year, when we finally got back in the schools again, we were taking a look at the new, the phonics curriculum for reading literacy at the elementary level, because um, that, that had been a shift and we visited classrooms and we heard from teachers about how they thought that was working. 
um, curriculum committee hasn't been incredible able to be incredibly active during the pandemic. I I didn't virtually visit any classrooms uh, when I was on, but that doesn't mean it, it it has to continue working that way. That's the joy of the committees and new members. And we did have a special education committee, or not committee, or council, advisory council, a couple of years ago with Matt Landau when we looked into oh, English as a, when it was transferred from ESL, English as a second language to English as a new language. I thought I remembered a previous committee on special education, and I did not realize that had expired which is why I thought like a board standing committee might be uh, re be <coughs> replicating something that already existed. Yeah, so if, Karen, you can speak to this more than I having participated because prior to my time, but that was the nuance between the advisory and the, and the committee, mm -hmm. that it was an advisor that established the inclusion uh, and there are community members involved. And I think with the committee, the committees might be specified in our bylaws as to what the board committees are, which would be different from advisory councils. If it's specified, some bylaws, they're specified in there. <laughs> so I haven't read these bylaws as of yet. You said we're tabling this one? Uh, we didn't say that, but that's something that I would consider. And if there's a motion, I think the table is a second. All in favor, we please. All right, so we are tabling item 8.5. We'll come back, including some conversations about possible other um, advisory councils and making sure that these advisory councils also follow our process, which includes specifying what their role is and what the expectations are. Fantastic. So, do you have that, Trisha? Mm -hmm. Um, item 8.6, design, designation of the delegate to the TST Boses Executive Committee. And can we move it without a name? Um, well, we can have a conversation now about who would be interested in doing it. And then Wait, editing. but this is not one of us, I believe. This is different from what Eldrin and I have served and Pat long ago served. I believe this is the Boses board, I believe. Yeah, that's a Brad Ranger. And that this past year it has been Brad Granger, or maybe past two years. I don't. I think the past couple. I think it's the past couple of years. Is is he willing to serve? Has anyone checked? I'll move that we table this until further discussion and clarity of the subject. Um, I spoke to him just yesterday. He seemed to be. Willing, but uh, I, I can't say that he gave me a definite yes. <laughs> I second the table. All in favor? All right, item 8.6 is also tabled. Um, item 8.7 board designee for impartial hearings appointment. Um, Pat, you have served on this role? Um, I will say that I was appointed, I think, the first two years that I was on the board. And in my in my memory, um, this is an honor that has traditionally gone to a newly elected member. <laughs> 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 because it involves basically no work at all. So the I'll so, cite you for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, when, so, so the the impartial so um, when it, um something. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so when there is, a, is it a, it's a due sort of process. Due process. Uh, when it, um, when a hearing has been requested or called an impartial hearing, which um, on some matter uh, reflecting district business, um, the administration. So, who in the administration? I believe it's Dan. Is that correct? You. Should, you you, impartial hearing appointments. You appoint an impartial hearing officer, who, the, the person who's actually going to hear the the uh, issue, and then a member of the board has to come in and sign a paper and sign off on it. And I think I might have done it for three years. And upon signed. reviewing, 
So yeah, you read the paper and you. I, I get. Yeah, I'm realizing I did last year. So Doc, who, who work? Who do they work with in New York team? Well, they have to be married more than one for. So Mary, do you want to give us any additional information about what the role is? Well, I just got called on. I was paying attention to something else. <laughs> <laughs> and there's just no gracious way out. <laughs> that, that, was about, <laughs> that was about as gracious as you could imagine. So that was very well done. We are talking about the board designee for impartial hearing appointments. And which board member were, would take on that role. Do you have additional information about what that role entails? And you can say no as well. No. <laughs> I, I think I can make this really yeah, short by no. saying I'd like to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I have experience with this. So oh, great. 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 Okay. So we're going to add. If, if, I'd if, like more information because okay. you're in a pool. Oh. Is it families, is it um, <laughs> staff and all? Because I don't want us to just kind of gloss over things because the individuals involved need some sort of support too well we we do not attend the hearings okay. we board members are not part of the hearings in any way shape or form and we are not even informed of what the issue is it's it is it is a rubber stamp of district practice in that sense to appoint the hearing officer the person right. who does the and the hearing officer hearing. will do the work so these these are not issues that actually the board deliberates over we just have to certify that the, the impartial hearing officer who is presiding over has the approval of the board to do that and that that does in fact involve an element of trust because we never get any feedback about those cases and the cases are few and far between we got a few over years anything but that, that, that it's, it's always a couple of years yeah yeah kind of yes. stuff that i don't think we actually want to know about <laughs> We just need to grab but I, I, and say but so do we also have knowledge of the guidelines of it? Is there enough notice given to the parties involved and all of that? Do is there some sort of documentation that states that? Yeah, I'm 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 now fully present at the crisis. <laughs> so yes, there is, and I can provide that. Um, as far as our practice and the policy, what we're obligated to do to support to ensure that caregivers and families know the due process that's shared um, anytime a family may reject an IEP we share those procedural safeguards from the state with them so they're aware of it and then collaborate with community partners such as the village Ithaca for and, and also we have appointed families and caregivers who have navigated the process that can act as a guide on the side um, but it is also in close collaboration with our legal counsel when we go to an impartial hearing, as well as Eric Murat from BOCES is another person who supports us, both us and the and the family and caregiver. So and I want to the hearing. I appreciate the way in which Karen phrased that. The idea that even the appointment of an impartial hearing officer, uh, for lack of a better word, cannot and should not be rubber stamped, right? That right. it's part of the process. Usually the recommendation comes to us and we don't have much say, but that's that, that's the role. So under understood. Are you still interested in giving this conversation? Are you still willing to serve? More than willing. <laughs> uh, so we, sure. you're gonna move it, Chris? Yes. Uh where was that? Well, okay, 8.7. 8 8.7. Uh, board designee of impartial hearing appointment. The Board of Education District desires to designate a member of the board as an official designee responsible for appointing impartial hearing officers in accordance with the regulations of the Commissioner of Education. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the District hereby designate Jill Tripp as a member of the Board of Education responsible for appointing an impartial hearing officer in accordance with the rationale no, so rotational. 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 Thank you both. <laughs> I caught it afterwards. <laughs> rotational selection process established by the Commissioner of Education in Section 200.2E of the Regulation of the Commissioner of Education to conduct hearings in the district pursuant to Section 4404.1 of the Educational Law. Second. So, so this reminds me there's it is the district is choosing a list of approved impartial hearing officers and they just rotate through it so it's not there's not 
um, there's not a set of criteria that, that appoints an impart, a, speci a specific impartial hearing officer to a specific case. Right. Additional questions, discussion? All in favor? Thank you, Joe. Uh, item 8.8, .8, designation of uh, designating official depositories. These are the financial institutions that we work with. Uh, I will move that the following banks and or trust companies be and hereby are designated as the official depositories for the funds of the city school district, Ithaca, New York, during the fiscal year 2022. 2023 Tompkins County Trust Company, Tompkins Trust Company, General Funds, Federal Aid Funds, Payroll Funds, School Lunch Funds, Construction and Capital Funds, Extracurricular Funds, Tax Deposit Funds, Health Benefit Funds, Fiduciary Funds, Fund Investment, M&T Bank, School Lunch Fund, Fund Investment, Chemung Canal Trust, Fund Investment, NILAF, New York Liquid Asset Fund, Fund Investment. Five Star Fund Investment, J.P. Morgan Chase Fund Investment, Key Bank Fund Investment, TD Bank Fund Investment, Tioga State Bank Fund Investment. Second. Amanda, is there anything that you'd like to say? I don't know if you're at the party or not. Right? <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. And um, so it's one, if this is approved, right, I send this off to our treasurer. And as Chris can tell you, as the chair of finance for the past couple of years, we may add institutions. I know this feels like there's a lot, but the reality is that school districts have limited opportunities to be able to leverage interest rates. And so we do we do work with a, consult, a consultant firm, three plus one, who actually works with municipalities and school districts to be able to find the best rates. And Eldred spoke to this the other day too about trying to diversify the portfolio as much as we can, right? Um, to be able to bring in even additional revenue on the monies that we have in what we would consider our savings, right? Um, being mindful of our cash flow to be able to pay our bills and um, all of our payroll. So um, just know that this is a moment in time and that this may evolve as necessary, but we always would update the finance committee and then that will go to the board meeting. Just, uh... You know, so looking at this, it would appear that in terms of, you know, who handles, you know, a lot of our accounts, it's a local Tompkins Trust company. Um, so they've got a lot of our money sitting there. Um, I'm just curious. And so the others are investments, except for M&T Bank also is listed as having money from our school lunch fund. And why is that? So, Emin, so remember that the school lunch fund, the C fund, if yes. it's independent, uh -huh. right? And so uh, typically uh, our treasurer, they get audited, um, but our treasurer supports them as sort of an independent mm -hmm. um, entity. And so um, what you're seeing there is really tradition. Uh -huh. um, and so we are sort of working with them um, to sort of build um, capacity around analysis of other institutions, and it may be m and and it may not be. Uh -huh. um, but their funds often have to have a lot of liquidity, right? So they have to be able to access them and move them out due to payments for commodities. And so it's a little bit different from some of the things that maybe trend a little better over the course of time. Okay, thank you. Additional questions, discussion? Um, just uh, more points of clarification and information for our new colleagues. A couple of years ago now, we decided to put the money up so we could make all of our school lunch programs free. Uh, so I took that budget from X to, I think we had to add another 1.5 million or something like that a year. So it's not an insubstantial amount of funds. Now. So I, I think you're some not schools. accurate there. Some schools. Mm -hmm. Yep. So some were, some, so the, so a few years ago, some schools qualified, right, due to free and, free and, free and reduced lunch rates. And then due to the pandemic, right, they made all of it free. And then there's been a lot of conversation about what actually is going to happen with that. Right now, it doesn't, it, it, we don't know if that um, program is officially finalized. And we're going to go back to um, some schools having the ability to offer um, free lunches to all based on their rates for their building. Um, so there's more uh, to come. I believe that in August, we're actually um, having Beth um, join us for the finance committee meeting because there are some conversations about school lunch rates. 
um, and breakfast rates, and also what Eldridge is alluding to. So um, right now in the current budget, we do sustain some operations of school lunch. We actually do a transfer over to school lunch, mainly for the benefits of their employees, right? So that does it, it alleviates their budget a little bit to be able to pay for what their fringe and benefits rates, right? Like health insurance, their ERS, which is employee retirement. Okay? Yeah. If there's no additional questions or discussion, all in favor? Fantastic. Moving on to item 8.9. Oh, I'll take this one. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Moira. Uh, I move item 8.9 that the Ithaca Journal be designated as the official newspaper for the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, during the school year 2022-2023 for the publication of all legal notices and such other data as required to be published by law and for which the same may be qualified to act. Second. Questions, discussion? We have to, I just to explain, we have to designate a daily newspaper, and that's why it's the Ithaca <laughs> Journal, even though I strongly believe that they should take Ithaca off the, the title of that newspaper since they do not publish pretty much anything about what's going on in Ithaca. Um, there, there was something in the last two days. Uh, oh. Is it still the legal requirement that it must be a print, news, a daily print newspaper? I have asked that question. I'm still waiting to get okay. clarification, but I believe at this point in time the answer is yes. It's supposed to be a daily print. I would presume that will be changing sometime soon. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask why not one four eight five only dot com, but I'm not sure if they come up. Thank you. I, oh, well, and they're not print. They're not print. Yeah. Right. I, I think the criteria is antiquated and it's yeah, not right. caught up to. Well, also, for instance, you know, the Syracuse newspaper, the Post Standard, does not offer a daily print edition anymore. It's like three days a week. So, oh, really? yes, how, how like, we just paid for our next year's Ithaca Journal subscription and. <laughs> Um, that's always an after space every <laughs> year, and um, and you know we have not been told that it will cease daily publication. But if it does, we have no other local alternative, and I don't know where the other right. A lot of communities is. find themselves in this situation as well. So I will follow up with our legal team. I'll respond back to all board members so everyone has the information. Uh, this is, for example, the place where we post notice of our um, public hearings, uh, where we post uh, notice of the upcoming budget vote. Um, right, that this is the publication that we're, we're required to select a publication where we notify the public of what's taking place in various ways. So sometimes it's 30 days, sometimes it's 45 days, but this is this is where we're at. And we do use other means in addition to the Ithaca Journal. This is what we're required to do. And, and so um, in terms of board members, are, who is the media designated coverage for? If there's any time a journalist or a quasi-journalist comes to any one of us, what? Um, Where is that? This is a, a this is a great topic of um, ongoing debate for our board in particular. Uh, NISBA recommends that any media requests go through. I'm not saying this for me, but go through the board president. Um, that has historically been what their practice is. Uh, the Ithaca City School District has um, been working to create a public information office. Um, which would include folks uh, who would be able to answer these questions as well. And we are still trying to find a process that works for all of us about what happens, not just when we get messages from members of the media, but when all board members, for example, receive an email. And is there a district, a, a board response or individual responses? The reality is we have not worked that out, um, just to be real. that we're, I think that would be part of our board development is to try to come up with a process that works for everybody, especially when there's disagreement, especially when some board members feel that should be communicated this way and other board members feel it should be communicated another way. There's also another tension point, maybe I should say tension point. 
There's also uh, sometimes some difference between what the board wants to communicate and what um, administration may want to communicate as well. So we have, there's a number of questions that we have to have some conversations about. For the time being, around media requests, um, I don't know that I recommend it goes, I think we should hold on to the idea that it goes to, at least to the board president to be informed or to the board officers, I should say, to be informed. And we can still work out what that means. And historically, the board officers have sent out to the full board, this is our um, pending response, please give us feedback, any adjustments before it goes out. Or board members have written to the board officers saying, I recommend, yeah. this is our response, can we all come to an agreement? We had a Google Doc at one point in time <laughs> trying to track who's going to respond to what email okay. right, in which way. Uh, yeah, that did not work well. Um, we have to find an efficient process. And I've been talking to other school districts, um, and I, their process is um, very hierarchical, and I'm not sure that I'm a, a fan of, of that process. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, would this be a good time for an introduction, Dr. Brown? We're talking about communications, and don't we have a new member of our staff here? Who? New member of our staff? No. Not no. no. Not today. Okay. Do we want to? We yeah. had, we approved an appointment at the last meeting. Yeah, the book. Yeah, uh, Miss Katie Hart will be right. beginning on August the first. August um, the first. Okay. Public information specialist. And then we have a communications coordinator, Margaret Devon, who will be starting uh, next week, July 7th. So we do have a team that's on. And the third person that's and, and joining uh, Casey Banks, who's been on for, for several years now. So we have a three member team. And I'll remind the folks who are listening um, we have been partnering with uh, uh, both City BOCES, and we had a contract for them to help us with communications over the past three, four years now. So we transitioned those funds uh, that we were sending off to do an external contract to now bring us in that service in house. And I guess you know we also there have been several uh, events that have driven home our need for a more coordinated communication approach. When uh, we had a couple of our schools on lockdown or not lock in. You know. The need and the nature of communications has transitioned pretty significantly over the decade I've been here. I mean, as I'm thinking about this meeting, I remember back in 2011, folks were questioning and upset that we were thinking about having a $20,000 contract to do communications with a third party. Mm -hmm. And so much so we had to go on the radio, we had to have deep conversations about mm -hmm. why a school district would need any type of communications coordination whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And here we find ourselves today with folks demanding information almost um, in a dynamic way um, as events are happening, i.e., um, lockdowns. So we've um, had to invest um, probably, probably underfunded and under resourced. Um, as we did an analysis, I think five years ago, most small city school districts are spending a million or a million and a half dollars each in communications at the department. And at the time, we were doing none of that. So this is something we're growing, but also growing the understanding of the community about the need. With this role, these roles. The only thing I would add is to, to emphasize the idea of a dynamic communication approach. Yeah. Um, so more than just a press release, mm -hmm. right? So we, we're trying to figure out how to do this work collaboratively, where we can all agree, at least all be informed. That's often another problem. Mm -hmm. um, that oftentimes not all board members have the same information, and so um, it, it's it's an area of growth for us. There's no question. I will say, uh, I will give Maureen the credit. She's due a lot of the difficult communications. She's taken the lead on, but not just as our master English agent, mm -hmm. but because she has so many relationships in the community. Sean has relationships with a particular area of our community because he taught there. I have particular. So we try to respond where it makes sense, but this is our master communicator as of right now. It's overwhelming. So I know we're talking about newspapers, I'm going to get us back here in a second, yeah. right? But the last thing is we oftentimes have to decide as well if we're signing something with all board members or signing something um, that one board member signs um, in response or on behalf of all board members. That's also that. I just want to see something in the public. 
Think about it. When's the last time we got to celebrate our athletes or our scholars in some publication, some local publication? But 10 years since I saw our scholar athletes giving their props and in our local rags. You know? So for just that reason, we, want, we need some communication, much less the more serious stuff. It's going to happen. So it's been moved. It's been seconded. Robust conversation. Can we call the question? All in favor? Unanimous. Excellent. Uh, agenda item 8.10, designation of signers. I will move that uh, the if, um, that Emily Ship as treasurer and Sydney Wade as assistant school business executive individually be and hereby are designated the authorized signers for the disbursement of all funds of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York, during the 2022-2023 school year. Second. Questions, discussion? All in favor? Fantastic, unanimous. Uh, 8.11, designation of internal auditor. Um, um, I'll move that the board designates Questar three BOCs as internal auditor for the Ithaca City School District for 2022-2023 school year. Second. This is part of the conversation we had earlier with Amanda. Any other discussion or questions? All in favor? Passes unanimously. Uh, 8.12 designated receivers of money. I'll move that the following positions be and hereby are designated receivers of money for the school year 2022-2023. Treasurer at the City School District, School Treasurer at the High School, School Treasurer at Wayman Alternative Community School, School Treasurer at DeWitt Middle School, School Treasurer at DeWitt Middle School, Library, Librarians and Library Clerks, School Secretary, All Schools, Cafeteria cashiers, tax collector, tax clerks, gate person, purchasing agent, chief operations officer, school lunch clerk, transportation director, wellness and athletics officer, athletic facilities manager, athletic equipment manager, director of child nutrition. Second. Questions and or discussion? All in favor? That's unanimously. 8.13 designation of independent auditor. Uh, I move that this board designates in Saroin Company CPA as independent auditors for the Ithaca City School District for the 2022-2023 school year. Second. Again, this is part of the conversation we had with Amanda about the audit committee. Any additional questions or discussion? All in favor? Unanimously, 8.14 designated custodians of money. Um, I move that the following positions be and hereby are designated custodians of money for the school year 2022-2023. Treasurer at the city school district, school treasurer at the high school, school treasurer Lehman Alternative Community School, school treasurer DeWitt Middle School. School Treasurer Boynton Middle School, School Secretary All Schools, Cafeteria Cashiers, Tax Collector, Tax Clerks, Purchasing Agent, Director of Child Nutrition, Transportation Director, and Wellness and Athletics Officer. Second. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Passes unanimously. Um, now on to agenda items 9, 9.1, authorization for the use of telephone, wire, and electronic banking services. I move that we approve that the Board of Education authorize Emily Scheich as treasurer and Sydney Wayne as assistant school district business executive individual to utilize telephone, wire, and electronic banking services at the Ithaca City School District designated official depository during the school year of 2022. Through 2023. Second. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Ask unanimously. 9.2. I move that Trisha Beresford, the clerk of the city school district, Ithaca, New York, and Amanda Burbo, the chief operations officer, be authorized 
to sign agreements, reports, and claims to the state education department in connection with the operation of the national school lunch program in the schools of the city school district, Ithaca, New York, for the 2022-2023 school year. Second. Questions or discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you in favor? Yes. Passes unanimously. I just pulled her not present. Okay. <laughs> uh, agenda item 9.3, authorization cert certification of payrolls. I'll move 9.3 that Robert Van Curen, the Chief Human Capital Officer, and or Amanda Berber, Berba, Chief Operations Officer B and hereby are authorized to certify all payrolls prepared on behalf of the Ithaca City School District, Ithaca, New York for the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Second. Discussions or questions? All in favor? That includes Eldred, passes unanimously. Uh, 9.4, authorization of cooperative bidding. Uh, I move that this board agrees to join with other school districts and BOCES in New York State in cooperative bidding as authorized by General Municipal Law Section 119-0 for the purpose of selected items for use in and by this district and that the clerks of the participating districts and or BOCES be authorized to act as agents for the preparation of specifications and for the receiving of sealed bids submitted in answer thereto, and that the board agrees to abide by majority decision of the participating agencies on quality standards, that unless all bids are rejected, it will award contracts according to the recommendations of the majority of participating agencies, if it desires to do so, and that after the award of contracts, it will conduct all negotiations directly with the successful bidder. Second. Amanda, does it make sense for you to just talk briefly about our cooperative bidding and the work that we do? Sure. So this is specific right, to uh, the BOCES working on our behalf. So we actually contract with uh, DCMO BOCES and other BOCES as needed to it's purchasing power, right? So the more folks that jump into a bid, if we all need particular products, right, you're able to leverage those funds so that we know that if 22 districts need something, you're getting a better price, right, versus if we did it alone. So the power of cooperative um, bidding and purchasing, it is mandated by law, it's very prescribed, right? You have to be very public, transparent, you have to be able to get those bids sealed, that that uh, sort of alleviates any kind of like relationships, right, to, to leverage any kind of awards being given. So that's really what that is. And so this is specific sort of to those supplies. And then obviously it talks about the standards that we would use. Um, for example, if somebody wins a bid and it's not a good product or they, um, you know, maybe didn't uh, meet the needs as described, it also provides that procedure as well for that. Additional questions? I, I remember over time we've had some pretty tough conversations within this group about whether or not we would allow bidding to be met by folks who deal with incarcerated individuals and whether or not we would allow local individuals who can prove they can meet our needs to have some kind of advantage is not the right word, but preference priority. priority. And I honestly can't, it's been a long time. So I don't know where we are with those, but I remember the tough conversations about that. So maybe once we're over this and we get into finance, you can refresh where we stand on that. We definitely talk about what the laws allow us to do. That's where we always ended up. Yeah, that's what right. was allowable, what was not allowable. Yes, and, and there are great people who can advise us on that out of finance, and maybe that can be an agenda item. Yes. Any other discussion or questions? All in favor? That is everyone but Mr. Malcolm, who is not here. 9.5, authority to invest funds. I move 9.5 that the Board of Education delegates the authority to invest school district monies to Amanda Burbo, the Chief Operations Officer, and or Emily Scheib, the Treasurer, in accordance with Sections 1604-A 
and 1723-A of the education law and any other pertinent regulations. Second. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Is everyone present except for Chris? Uh, uh, I'll move. Oh, sorry. No, please. please. <laughs> I'll move 9.6 authorization of petty cash funds. Uh, that the um, Board of Education hereby authorizes the establishment of petty cash funds for the fiscal year 2022 23 in the amounts listed and appoint the designated positions as custodians of funds. And all of the, oh, it's just two. Ithaca City School District Treasurer, $100. Ithaca City School District Transportation Director, $100. Second. Discussion or questions? Amanda, if I'm not mistaken, we have had some conversation about the amount of money. Yes, we, we like to keep it as low as possible, right? So any, any cash is risk. Um, right, so that's why you see very few stewards of actual cash in the district. Um, and again, these are good things like, so for example, a transportation, if somebody were to go on a trip, right, and we knew that they needed to, they were going to be a full day and they needed to get a meal instead of like getting the district credit card, it might be something like this, or they use their own money, like we have to track everything, everything that comes in and everything that goes out. So we, we, would, we like to keep things small and we like to keep things few um, when it comes to paying cash. Any additional questions or discussion? All in favor? Is everyone, except for Mr. Malcolm, is not in the room. Um, authorization of cell phones for select employees. I will move. Board of Education recognizes that select district employees will be required to carry district owned cell phones in order to meet their job responsibilities. Such phones should be provided only when a less costly alternative. For example, paper radio is not available or it is not appropriate in the circumstances. Do I have to read the rest of it? I think we will get the point. Mm -hmm. That's right. okay by. Yeah. Question? Yes. Um, oh, second and then question. <laughs> um, so uh, it says a list of job titles requiring district owned cell phones shall be maintained and that it will be. Um, it will be reported to the board for its approval at its reorganizational meeting. Do we have a list? Um, no, but I, this is also a policy that Amanda and I have been having a conversation about that will be updated. So um, it, we can table it uh, because it's probably going to change. If you look, the last approval date was 2009. And the idea of cell phones has gone from being a luxury to an absolute necessity. Right. So uh, we are well behind in, in this policy in particular. It, it's an outdated policy that we, that Amanda and I already know, we've already been in conversation about, it has to be updated. And I think our auditors actually told us, asked us to update it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I move we table uh, item 9.7 authorization of cell phone for select. Does that mean that our select employees won't get cell phones for the month of July, though, and that they might? I think what them? it means is that the policy from last year will carry over until we make some okay, kind of right. difficult change. I'll second that that motion at the table. All in favor of tabling? And unanimously, Mr. Malcolm. Um, up next is our consent agenda. Um, our consent agenda, we do not normally go through each item individually. Right. Usually the items are, for lack of a better word, packaged together. Um, we will highlight key things. This is regularly uh, in our consent agenda, it usually includes the personnel report and includes um, student, student services that are provided. It usually includes sometimes the moving of money between accounts or uh, things that come from the finance committee or facilities committee. Um, you can see here, though, this consent agenda also includes um, folks who will be acting principals uh, when an administrator is not in the building or not present. And so you'll find that there's one for the high school, for Boynton, I mean, it goes through for um, all of our secondary schools and, and elementary schools as well. So um, 
question about that? Yep, happy to. Um, we, that, have, we haven't moved or seconded it, but let's talk first. And see uh, well, I, I noticed that the acting principal uh, are only designated in the buildings where there is an associate principal. <coughs> uh, what does it mean for the buildings where there is not an associate principal? In the past, we um, had, a, had a superintendent designee. Uh, that was the language, but I don't we have a name in person. Um, right. So that brings up a great question because I don't see where we have that. that it, it's place. not here. So it should there should be something that says in all other buildings there will be superintendent or designee yeah. as acting principal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that is something that should be added to the August yeah, meeting. August yeah. meeting. Some language about acting principals in schools that are not listed here. Mm -hmm. We do have a July meeting scheduled. We oh wait, is it the end of July? And it's the July twenty ninth. Who did such a thing? July what? Twenty six. And we're not the end of the tenth. Today's the first. No, it wouldn't be twenty six. Look at a different date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I will be. Okay. We'll be in time. But yeah, anyway, okay. whatever the next meeting is, and right. um, we'll add that language along with the table of items, which automatically come up to the next uh, board meeting as well. So, have we? No, no one has moved the consent agenda. So I'll move the consent agenda. Are we moving it to table? No, no, no. no. Oh, oh, I will second the consent agenda then. Um, uh, wait, we're approving the minutes. I, when I last looked, I hadn't seen the minutes, but they're from the last meeting. So, uh, I wasn't at the last meeting. That work. <laughs> um, well, well, remember, well, we sir. comprised a uh, quorum, yeah. five of us. Oh. You, uh, yeah, but, <laughs> now I'm concerned. Searching. Let me just add that um, consent agenda does cover a lot of stuff. But when we are in executive session, we discuss these, and if somebody feels strongly, we can have about moving something out of that consent agenda onto a different part of the agenda. We will consider. It. We've done that. Um, and there's still the opportunity for discussion, questions, well, any consent, yes, um, agenda item. Um, I will say that we are still working through um, minutes for meetings. Right. Um, the law has changed substantially in COVID, um, where we are not required to keep minutes the ways in which we have historically, that we um, publish a transcript. And we um, were required by law to publish a transcript as the minutes. And we have included on our transcript, um, because usually something like Zoom uh, automatically transcribes, uh, but it is regularly uh, not correct, <laughs> right? Uh, so it does not question, do the best right. job of. A question about that. So um, when, like, the last meeting was not a hybrid meeting. That's correct. Um, this Zoom, but we did have. No, we didn't have. Well, we we were broadcasting by Zoom. Yeah. Is a transcript created? Under those circumstances, we weren't broadcasting by Zoom. Or we, I mean, yeah, like, people could watch the meeting; they just couldn't up. participate in. We were broadcasting by a. By a yes. oh. we, can, we can ask. We can okay. actually. Get it. Okay. I was going to say that I was told for in-person meetings that we go back to doing minutes, right? But if a transcript is requested, we can provide a transcript. Right. And so there is a transcript from the last meeting. There is a transcript from, via Zoom. Via Zoom. We, we were using an outside source, but that was the only way it was hybrid. Uh huh. Right. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So I, I'm not able to access the minutes because I have trouble getting internet access to the So is, are you asking us to do something about the minutes to remove? Well, I, I, don't, I can't approve them if I haven't seen them. Understood. So, so I, I could abstain from the consent agenda. Or, or what we could do is move the minutes to the next, we can table yeah, the, minutes table the minutes until Let's the that. next board meeting. Yeah. Are you making that motion? Yes, I will make the motion to table the minutes, approval of the minutes of the uh, um, June 28th uh, monthly discussion and voting meeting until the next meeting. Second. All in favor of tabling the minutes? 
All opposed? I abstain. Or abstain. Yeah. Yeah. Now it brings us back to the consent agenda. I'm sure um, we are already out of order. For oh, okay. Yeah. So, so the, the consent agenda has been moved and seconded. Any other additional questions or conversations? Okay. All in favor of the consent agenda? That's the name is Lee and Mr. Hopkins here as well. School district business, uh, item 14. Uh, this is the adoption of the 2022-2023 um, meeting agenda or meeting schedule. Um, we published this. It is uh, definitely able to be changed um, for a variety of reasons, which we've done before. Uh, for example, school is canceled on a particular day because of a snowstorm. We usually do not have a meeting on those days, right? And, uh, or if we need to add an additional meeting, um, our historically we should have talked about this previously, but you can see it in the schedule as well. Um, I think the first Tuesdays of the month have historically been policy and HR committee. The second Tuesday is a full board meeting. The third Tuesday is facilities and finance, and I'm missing. And uh, legislative advocacy meets in before the a regular uh, board meeting, yeah. which would be the third or the second, the second, Tuesday. Tuesday. second yeah. Tuesday. And then curriculum instruction is before the, the fourth. Four. And then the third. Right. So committee, full board meeting, oh, right. committees, full board meeting. Right. On uh, months that we have five Tuesdays, uh, we usually try to hold those open for board development sessions. And I would anticipate that we will have board development sessions this this year. So no one has moved. Oh, oh. I move. Um, I move adoption of the 2022-2023 board meeting schedule as presented. Second. Discussion questions. All in favor. Maybe I'll just uh, say that, um, you know, some of these Tuesdays where there have been some of like, for instance, I have been on HRN policy. So that first Tuesday, I have a long meeting day. And then those of, who are in uh, the committees that meet prior to a regular board meeting, they have a long day. However, before we landed on this schedule several years ago, our, our committee work sessions were like all over the map, uh, any day of the week. And, um, and particularly for our staff, it was difficult. And this has made it much easier for the staff to know that Tuesdays are meeting day. And it's made it easier for board members, it's Tuesdays. Um, and for the community as well. They yeah. Meetings are on Tuesdays. Yeah, my, my first six years on the board, I would I would sometimes be out two or three evenings a week um, doing board uh, related work. And I will say personally that if we had not moved to this Tuesdays only schedule, I would not have run for a third term. Um, it, it really was draining. And in my experience, this has been much more manageable. Your friends and families will learn quickly that you don't exist on Tuesday evenings. Tuesday after one. What you do before <laughs> then is uh, if there's no more discussion, um, all in favor. Fantastic. It passes unanimously. Um, the last item on our agenda is item 14.2 vacancy. Um, we had a uh, a uh, long-serving uh, board member, Nicole Lefebvre, has submitted um, resignation from the board. Uh, it means that we have a vacant seat. Um, we will uh, address Nicole's contributions uh, and commitment to the district at a later date. Uh, but what we thought would be important, especially for our new board members, to understand um, the possible options for a vacant seat um, when there's a resignation. Uh, the board can do one of three things. Uh, it can leave the seat open and vacant to the next election. That's one option. It can hold a special election to fill the seat. 
Um, that's another option. And then the third option is the board can appoint a person to serve for a one year term until the next election. And then the person has to be whoever was the elected from there. Um, in terms of appointments um, or possible appointments, boards have done a variety of things. Uh, they have uh, appointed the next highest vote getter, depending on how close it was to an election. They've appointed prior board members who have board experience, given that it's a one year term. They've held- Or, or even less. Or even less, right. They've held special processes, interview processes. Um, but the reality is about the appointment, the board decides the appointment. Uh, and th the board decides whatever way they want to go. So those are the three options. Um, we are not going to take any action today. Um, we want to make sure everyone had information to understand what the possibilities are. We'll put it on July something uh, agenda to have a conversation about what is the best path forward. Um, or if the board so wishes, we can also hold a special meeting to address this issue as well. So we'll have some of this conversation. We'll get some feedback about what the, the next process is. Yes, I just say historically, certainly in my time on the board, and we have had vacancies. Um, we've sometimes left things open, like uh, Kelly Evans uh, has been, she resigned, I forget when, but we left it open at that point. Um, to my knowledge, we've never held a special election. That is correct. Um, Elections are expensive. It right. doesn't mean we can't, but it does mean that, that we never have. That's right. That's right. Right. We have never had, not in my time on the board, and we've had, um, you know, a, a multiple vacancies for a variety of reasons. Right. So, so yes. Any special objection to the person winning that election still on your one year term? My, no, that's the difference. Okay. Right. If there's a special election, the person would complete the term of the person who resigned. Who and, that is and that is to 2024. That is to 2024. Right. If there's an appointment, the person only serves to the next election, which would be May right. of 2023. Or it could be vacant until I'm, May. I believe, I can't remember what it is, but if we were to decide on a special election, it has to be held within a certain amount of time. Or there's yes. some time yep. constraints. Yep. Yeah, there are some time constraints to do that, uh, to at least announce a special election, which also requires public notice well in advance. I think it's at least 45 days. Right. Trisha would know how that. 45 days. So, so are there questions about? Process. The point of that was just to give information, was not to for us to, to make any decisions. Is it appropriate to make comments at this point, or do you just want to just leave it out there? Some I, of us have known for what has it been? Two days, three days? Two About days. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is very um, this is very sudden. Yeah. Yeah. It's new. It's new for everybody. Yeah. I think it'd be best from my own personal perspective, it'd be best for us all just to sit with the information and think about the best way to proceed. And we'll, we'll follow up. So for all board members, you'll be getting an email from um, probably Tricia or Moira and myself about uh, committee preferences, about liaison preferences. Um, we will follow up with the tabled items at the upcoming board meeting and uh, there'll probably be some additional information that happens. I hope uh, for our new board members that your, your ICSD emails are working. Um, we try to use our ICSD, ICSD emails. Um, it's important to say to everybody that those emails, anything that is sent, doesn't matter whether it's your ICSD email or not, is um, uh, something that can be foiled. And so, There'll be times when um, the member of the board will say, this is not appropriate for an email conversation. We need to have this in public, right? So that, that will happen at some point in time for all of us. So just remember that. Anything else? So we will receive ICSD emails prior to receiving any committee liaison requests. We should have an email set up today. Okay. Let us, let me double check. Yes, and if not today, we'll, uh, we'll, they we'll work be. on that. And with them on devices. What does that mean? Oh, yeah, we'll talk about that. So yeah, we'll talk about it. Sorry, go ahead. I apologize. And does the board um, have board insurance, the board members? 
Meaning board insurance. Like what of director's insurance in case any any um liability. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not that we yes, 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 yes. We yeah. we absolutely do okay. and um also includes uh access to legal counsel if it's connected to your role as a school board member. Right. Yeah. I have heard this over the years and never checked it out legally myself, but I have confidence in the folks who are telling us this, that we are only board members when we're at this table mm -hmm. or in a community meeting or an exec session. When we leave this building, we are not operating under the umbrella of being a board member. So that's an important distinction to make. Uh, and I don't know if our insurance still covers us when we walk out, but that's always been my assumption based on that information. Bob, can you clarify, please? Was Bob present there? <laughs> <laughs> what? It wasn't there for life, man. I'm here. I was here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what more I said. Eldred, uh, Eldred said it. I think. Okay. okay. Word for word. The way I uh, said it. It is. Uh, uh, the, you know, the difference between a city council person, for example, is a council person. 24 hours a day for their term. And for the new members, as you learn when you go through the school boards association training that all new members have to take, uh, your role really is when the when the gavel strikes your board members and when it strikes to end the meeting, you are private citizens again. Uh, not that the work doesn't continue, but just keep that in mind as you go into buildings or talk to employees that you know you're a private citizen during those conversations. Um, and other times you're here, you're board member. And the last thing I'll say about the um, orientation and the training that you go through from NISBA, what I've heard from multiple new board members is that um, it's a great beginning, but it's inadequate. So please feel free to ask questions. We may go through things a little bit slower the first couple months just to make sure that folks have had their questions answered. But um, NISBA is a great organization with you know fantastic information. But the required training is not going to give you all the information that you need, and particularly because each school district over 700 in New York State does things radically different. So learning what we do here, or even questioning what we do here is always helpful for fresh eyes to be like, should we do it this way? Should we try to do some changes? So with that being said, a two and a half hour reward meeting is not too bad. We've had longer, we've had shorter. Uh, but uh, if it's good by everybody, I will close the meeting and wish everybody well on a 90 degree Friday. Enjoy, enjoy. Welcome both of you again. Yes. yes.